Welcome to Interact 2016. <laughs> a lot of people have put in a ton of work and you all have traveled from very far away uh, to come here and we're super excited to see you, to meet you, to uh, reunite with some of you and hear what our presenters have to say and to interact. Okay, so now it's my privilege to welcome our very first presenter and you all will know her as a PhD in research policy and administration. You'll know her as a world-class presenter who will literally travel from Michigan to Malaysia to talk about the importance of interactions between teachers and students. You'll know that she has a strong foundation in education, having been an early childhood special education teacher. You'll know that she's an author, a resource, a trendsetter, an avid UVA sports fan, and a CEO, what you don't know is that when it's time for Girl Scout cookie season, she turns into a hardened saleswoman <laughs> and comes into the office with a sign-up sheet for the cookies, pictures drawn by her daughter thanking us in advance for buying them, <laughs> and samples of every type of cookie to encourage us to buy. <laughs> so she does have a little salesmanship in there. This is our CEO, our leader, Rebecca Berlin. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, that was a good, like, education. So I am so excited to welcome everyone to the first Interact Conference. Um, thank you for braving the cold. When we originally planned this, being originally from Michigan, I remember sitting with Lisa and saying, we want to do Chicago. How late into April do we need to go to make sure we are safe and we don't have any snow delays? So as I was sitting on the tarmac on Saturday, um, in a snow blizzard and a delay for de-icing, I thought to myself, hmm, obviously my mother did not teach me well how late in the Midwest we need to go to avoid snow. So not sure about uh, location for internet ne next year, but it might have to be May in Illinois or April in Florida. So. <laughs> But I, but I am happy to say that at 8 a.m. this morning, the snow, came, the, the snow subsided, the sun came out, and I was thanking Melissa, who is our local representative from Chicago, for doing that. <laughs> so. so as Aline mentioned, I'm Rebecca Berlin, and I'm the interim CEO and chief strategy officer at Teachstone. And in that role, I have this amazing opportunity to, to travel across the country and talk to teachers, talk to coaches, talk to professors, talk to state representatives about how to best create the system of high quality early childhood education. But today, instead of me having to travel tens of thousands of miles to see each of you, you all travel to Chicago so that we could interact together and spend time together. So the first thing I wanted to do is just share a little bit about who is here today. So we have 150 attendees, which was our goal. So we are so excited um, to have kind of a standing room only crowd today. We have over 34 states represented. We have 12 from Florida, 11 from Texas, eight from New York, <laughs> hey Michelle, <laughs> six from Arkansas, th three from Washington State, one from Maine, and one from Hawaii. Kim, thank you. She, Kim came on a red eye and just landed today. So we have four countries represented. As you know, class is starting to go international. So we have the US, Germany, Chile, in Singapore. And just to show what a small community the early childhood community is, I was in Costa Rica a week ago and I ran into Christine who is friends with Dora and Serene who are here. And Christine said to make sure I gave a, a, a huge Singapore hello to her colleagues. So about 30 of our participants, about 20% are from Head Start programs. And we have 12 participants from partners uh, national partners, so Teaching Strategies, Ounce of Prevention, Sesame Street, NACI, NHSA, and Highscope. 
And it, for those of you who know me, I'm a data person and I love to review data. So what did I do on the plane? I took the list and I was looking about titles because I'm always, always interested to see who comes and why do they come. So we have a long list of titles. So we have class assessors, we have professional development specialists, we have consultants, we have foundation representatives, teachers, coaches, state level administrators, county, and district and state administrators. Um, as Aline mentioned, we have participants joining us remotely through live streaming. I want to say a special hello to our Teachstone staff, both in the home office and in their, and in their individual field offices, um, for joining us and for supporting us from afar. So I always do this in staff meetings, so I'm going to give them a wave. So uh, hello to Teachstone staff. I also wanted to say a special hello to Jared Jacobs, who, as you know, is the NACI past president and also a professor at the University of South Dakota. She was hoping to, to join us today, but wasn't. So I said, told her I would uh, let her, that she could join via live streaming, and I wanted to say a special hello to her. So thank you to everyone who's joining us through live streaming. So those of you who have worked with me in the past know that I'm very interested in the context of what you're doing, the why you're doing it, the how you're doing it. So I thought it would be helpful. Ooh. <laughs> we were talking about strobe lights, Mike, weren't we, for your presentation, but we didn't <laughs> talk about them for mine. So I always want to know kind of how your system works, because I think it's so important to have that background information as we discuss early learning, either if we're doing it face to face or if we're doing it virtually. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of information about Interact and the context for Interact. So about four years ago, um, when I started at Teachstone, I had a conversation with Deb Mathias about how we can form more community around class. And what we started to do was a, um, a conference call based uh, professional learning community. And but what I quickly found out is that people didn't want to hear me talk, right? They wanted to hear stories from each other. They wanted to hear about the challenges they were facing. They wanted to hear about um, the successes they were having. They wanted to hear, to see the lessons that they had learned. About the same time, Lisa Rogoff joined us as our marketing director. And she was always up for a big challenge. And she came to me and said, wouldn't it be amazing if we could bring together our clients our potential clients and our staff to talk about implementation, to talk about research, and to talk about stories from the field. And what if we did this great big conference and brought lots and lots of people together? So four years later, Lisa's wish came true. Um, and thanks to Lisa and the incredible team at Teachstone, we are very excited to, to launch our first Interact conference. So we know that interactions are the core of everything we do as early learning professionals. And that each of us here today lives an incredibly busy life, serving our organizations, serving our communities, and serving our families. It seems like we never have enough time to reflect on what we do, to learn from others, or to share our stories. But we know it's through interactions as a, at events such as this that we are able to pause for a few moments and take that time we need to reflect, to learn, and to share. This summit was created to bring together leaders from national organizations, states and cities and communities from across the country and provide each of you the opportunity to share those stories with each other so that we can work to improve the lives of children and families and the teachers of our communities. So these interactions will happen through presentations today and through the discussions in those presentations. But as um, Aline said, really more importantly, those discussions will happen in the hallways, they'll happen at the lunch breaks, and they'll happen at happy hour. One of my favorite memories from a conference is from NACI uh, a couple of years ago when it was in Washington, D.C. in the convention center. And uh, Margie Wallen from the Ounce of Prevention and I got takeout from Perry Perry Chicken, literally sat on the floor in the convention center and spent time talking about policy questions in Illinois, in Michigan, and in Louisiana. And we also tried to solve all the other world's problems. <laughs> so I urge you to do that at Interact. We have lots of chairs here though, so you don't have to sit on the floor. Not always the most comfortable thing to do. So as I travel across the country, what I hear most from each of you is you long that time to share stories, 
about states and about communities. So please take the time during the next two days to connect with old friends and to meet new ones. Share successes, laugh about hiccups you have faced, ponder challenges. Cry if you have to, shout if you have to. Come together to share similarities, bond with each other, and form communities to ensure bright futures for every child in every state, city, and community across the world. That is what Interact is really about. So before I end, I have the honor of introducing two colleagues who really need no introduction. They are leading examples of how to improve quality early childhood education for all children, no matter what their zip code. So Yvette Fuentes, Sanchez Fuentes is currently president of the National Alliance of Hispanic Families. We know of best for her time when she served as director of the Office of Head Start. During that time, she led the effort to improving the quality of early childhood development for our nation's most vulnerable children. She will share her thoughts on the future of early learning. After Yvette speaks, we'll have Bridget Hamry, who's the co-founder of Teachstone and research associate professor and associate director for the University of Virginia's Center for the Advanced Study of Teaching and Learning, as we know Castle. We know Bridget for her development with her co-authors of the class system ranging from infant to secondary. I think it's always important to find out a little bit something new about uh, someone you've known for a long time. So on the um, plane, I was reading Bridget's bio, um, and there's a quote in there that says, um, when she was younger, she told her mom there were three things that she would never do. Wear bell bottoms, <laughs> buy a minivan, and teach. She went on to do all three. <laughs> so, well, two things. One, we're very similar in many ways. As when Bridget comes up, you will see that we are wearing a very similar dress, <laughs> which we did not plan. Um, so we're similar in many ways, but I did, I did two of the three, but I never did buy the minivan. <laughs> so, All joking aside, Bridget is an unwavering expert in how to best support powerful relationships and resulting interactions between teachers and children. She will share with us today her thoughts on ensuring we meet this need for all children. So Yvette, the floor is yours. Hey, good morning. good morning. Buenos dias. You know, there's a lot of research now around dual language learners, so <laughs> we need to put it out there as much as we can. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Thanks so much for the introduction. I want to thank the folks at Teach Zone for inviting me. I want to thank Bridget and, and Bob as well, and uh, my colleague Jennifer Park, who I think many of you are going to meet later. So. I think I am most infamous, um, as Rebecca mentioned, um, for running the Office of Head Start when we actually implemented class, right? I see people nodding their heads, it's okay. Raise your hand, yep, yep, all right. Some of you may not be all that happy with it, but um, that's okay, right? We gotta be honest about these things. And I love these intimate rooms. So if you've seen me speak before, you know I love these small, intimate rooms. Um, and I will also be around all day, so if folks want to connect or, you know, share some, some thoughts um, about how things have been going, let me know. Happy to always talk. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm happy to be here with all of you today. I am grateful that Rebecca gave us a quick snapshot of who's in the room, because it's always interesting to me to think about who has decided to come to these events. Um, and why you come. Um, clearly, we all work with children and families every day across this country in a variety of communities. And so this morning, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about your role. And not just your role as class trainers or class instructors, teachers, administrators, folks in states, but thinking about your role as leaders. Leaders make a lot of things happen, whether you're a leader in a classroom, whether you're a leader in your program, a leader at the state level, a leader in the federal government, and I'll go so far as to say leaders in your families, right? You make a lot of decisions every day that impact somebody within your circle, within your context, within your community, within your environment. So I'm gonna spend a tiny bit of time talking about that, but I also wanna acknowledge that um, many of you, like me, 
have probably sat through a lot of keynote speeches. And probably like me, you often don't remember either who that speaker was or what they talked about, right? I, it's okay. I, listen, I'm realistic about these things. So what I want to start by saying is that um, I'm hoping that you just leave with one thing. You don't have to remember me or you don't have to remember what I said, but try to keep one thing in mind as you go into the next two days of interacting with each other and the types of interactions that you decide to have, okay? So keep that in mind because I know it's tough. I also just want to say thanks to all of you for taking the time to be here. It takes a commitment to make those decisions, to come out for two days, some of you three days, depending on where you're flying from, some of you four, if you're coming from Hawaii or other countries. Um, it takes a commitment to be able to leave your families, to leave the work that you do, and trust that things are gonna continue on a normal basis. I know I suffer from that too. So I just wanna acknowledge that and say thanks to all of you for the commitment that you're making and being here today. So I'm sure that many of you are familiar with class. Yeah? <laughs> okay. So let me just say this, that I'm gonna speak a little bit to Head Start, but not a lot because we all know what's happened there. But let me just say this, that in the federal government, when we had to implement class, what we really realized was that we did need a valid, reliable instrument to be able to observe the interaction between children and teachers. And to be quite honest with you, while that implementation was not always smooth and easy, it was worth it. Because what that has led us to think about is interactions for kids with other adults, not just with the teachers who they interact with every day, but thinking about what happens between children and their parents, right? We have a lot of conversations today around trauma-informed care and toxic stress. Think about the interaction that kids have with other adults in their communities, in their programs, in their faith-based organizations. And so, like many of you know, for too many years in the early childhood field, we really relied on environmental features as a proxy to figuring out quality. And that worked for a while, and we should not do away with those things, but it's time for us to really figure out how do we use all of these things together. I do wanna say that, you know, it's been 50 years, and I always gotta bring up LBJ and the War on Poverty. It's been 50 years since the War on Poverty was implemented by Lyndon Johnson. But one of the things that we continue to see is that many of our families continue into one generation after another of poverty. And so, you know, I don't know the communities that many of you work with, but I'm assuming that at some level, you've had some interaction with low-income communities, with children and families who are really suffering and dealing with some very deep challenges that impact how they move forward. And so your choice to be here today and your decision to use class or to get involved in this movement around thinking about quality interactions today demonstrates your commitment and your leadership within your community, your program, your children, and your families. So probably many of you are thinking like, I'm not a leader of my program, I didn't make this decision, somebody else made it, right? I don't often get to think about what types of decisions are being made for my kids and my families. Somebody just tells me what to do, and it's my job to figure out how to do that well. But let me say this to you. The places that you work and you live are all contained within a larger system. And the choices that somebody else is making or the choices that you are making every day have a definite impact on the child of a, uh, on the life of a child and their family, right? It's as simple as what happens when those families walk through the door, when they walk through your classroom, or what happens at the end of the day when they're walking out the door and going home. Something that you've done or something that you've helped others to figure out how to do impacts the life of that child and that parent. And so I hope that you'll consider that 
as you think about the choices that you're making every day in your programs. And I hope that you'll take some responsibility and some commitment to making sure that you're interacting with the people who do make decisions in your programs. Because let me say this, in my experience, leaders actually motivate and interact with others, right? And they bring people along as they're making decisions. And so while we all may be at different levels within our communities, within our programs, within our states, we all have the ability to make some slight choice that may make one small change. But when you think about all of those small changes layered on top of one another, then that leads us to bigger change. So we know that too many kids that start kindergarten are already behind. You know the data, many of our poor kids often start school far behind in their verbal skills. And we know that those gaps tend to persist. But we also know, which is why you're here, we also know that high quality early education experiences can help get kids ready for school. You know about the data, right? High dropout rates among African American young men, high pregnancy rates for young Latinas. But you also know that the experiences that kids have in the first five years of their life make a difference for the next 80 years of their life. And that's why you're here. So as you're thinking about what you're doing every day, I want you again to think about the systems that you're in and to think about that your small choices, your small choices every day really do make a difference. I know sometimes they feel like they don't, but if you talk to somebody who's been in a program for a really long time and they tell you like where did change start, it started because somebody made a choice, whether it was to speak up, to do something different, to decide that they were gonna use class, to decide they were gonna send their staff for professional development, it was because somebody made a small difference. I do wanna say that our next big challenge is figuring out how we use this data, right? So this is the next big thing. There's a lot of data. Everybody's collecting data from the state level to local programs, we get all kinds of data. We know what families look like, we know what their needs are, but what we're missing is what do we do with that data? So I think as you're thinking about the sessions that you're getting involved in, really start to think about how do you stop, just stop, before you make a huge decision based on data that you have. One of the things that we often saw in Head Start was that people were very reactionary. And I get it, like I get it. You gotta keep your funding, you gotta get ready for your monitoring, you gotta adhere to thousands of regulations, both at the federal level, at the state level, at the, like I get it, like things are happening, you're moving fast. But I would just ask you all, as you're looking at your data, as you're thinking about what your kids and your families need, and your data's telling you that, take a moment to stop. Take a moment to stop and think about, within the resources that I have, am I using them in the right way? Is it time for me to think about reallocating my resources in a way that really supports the individual children and families that we are serving every day? So just take a moment and stop. So I'm gonna end with a quick quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, who has become like my new hero. You guys gotta read about her. So Eleanor Roosevelt is famous for saying that if you care about your own kids, you gotta care about everybody else's kids because your kids are going out in the world with those kids. So if you don't remember anything else I said today, think about that because I do think that it's often really easy for us to think about what's happening in this moment, but we forget that our own kids and the kids that we interact with every day, they're going out into a bigger world with a lot of other kids. So I just thank you for your time today. I will be around looking forward to connecting, to interacting with many of you, whether it's on the floor, at happy hour, um, and I wish you all the very best. So thanks everyone. All right, well, hello, everyone. Well, thanks, Yvette. Um, 
I feel so privileged right now, I just have to say. Um, one of the greatest things about being involved uh, in this effort across the past 15 years or so is getting to meet many of you, um, getting to know a vet who I can now call a friend. And I think for any of you who are in Head Start, be really thankful for a vet and what she brought to the office during her tenure there because I can tell you, having been on the inside, using the class in Head Start could have been a total disaster. Like there were many opportunities for, and it was hard and it continues to be hard and it's a challenge. But when people ask me, do you like class being used in the DRS or as a part of quality rating? What I always say is at the end of the day, people actually are paying attention to interactions now in a way that they weren't before. And so despite all the challenges, all the bad things, I think that we've done good and Yvette has done good and all of you who are sort of out there in the world um, are doing so much. And so I just, I'm, I'm so thankful and really honored to be here today and be, to be able to talk to you, get to see some old friends. Um, I was joking with Jonathan up, up here in the front. So uh, I don't know what it was, 2006, maybe, a few, a few years ago. Um, when we, we realized we were getting, we'd done lots of trainings, but we were realizing people really wanted to take this tool um, and do something with it, more with it. And so we realized we needed to develop a sort of train the trainer model. So um, as I think Jonathan th said this morning, like there were a bunch of us in a room together sort of fumbling along around, okay, well like I can train some people to do this, but how do I train others to do that? And we've really reached a level of scale at that that um, I don't think any of us could have anticipated. So, um, so anyway, thank you for joining me on this journey. And, and the other folks I wanna thank in the room are really my Teachstone colleagues. So one of the greatest privileges of doing this work, and, and I know Bob, he'll be here um, this evening and tomorrow would say the same, is that I've gotten to keep my day job <laughs> and still have this amazing work happen. So, you know, my day job, which I actually really love, um, is to do research at UVA. And I get lots of great opportunities and I do fun and interesting things there. Um, and so again, it's just such an honor to know that this work has moved forward and that's because of, of all of you in the room who've worked with Teachstone um, across the year, so, so thank you. Um, so no surprise, I'm gonna be talking about interactions. Um, one thing that I was thinking about on the, on the airplane, which I barely made because I managed to forget my ID, that has never happened to me in all my years of travel, and it is why I'm so appreciative to live in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I could be there an hour ahead of time, run home, go get my ID, come back, and still make my flight, right? Um, Okay, so once I got on the plane and I took a breath and settled down, um, I was thinking about this word interactions. Um, and one of the things that I think is so cool about the class, a little biased, um, so when I say interactions, you're thinking about interactions between teachers and children. But if I put my statistical hat on, when I say the word interactions, it's kind of like a multiplier, right? And that's what I think of as the class. Like, I'm not sure how we did it, Bob would tell you it was all totally intentional, um, right? Like he had this idea, like he imagined this room 15 years ago, and I think he probably did. Um, but, but I'm not sure how we did it, but something about the tool that we developed has allowed each of you to take it and do something with it. Some of it that we anticipated, some of it that we didn't anticipate, and it's really that sort of multiplier effect that brings us all here today um, that I think is so cool. And I think we still have lots to learn. And so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this sort of seed of an idea that we started with um, really in Bob's brain and the brains of many other um, folks out in the world. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how that idea has grown um, and how we're sort of here today continuing to spread that, that sort of seed of an idea. Um, so what is the seed of the idea? Well, no one will be surprised to know that that seed is really, that it is the interactions that teachers and adults, as, as Yvette pointed out, uh, adults and children have throughout their lives, from the moment they're born, maybe before they're born, um, through adolescence and beyond. Those are the things that really, really matter. That's what brings us here today, um, and I think something that we all, all hold, uh, you know, hold really deeply. I think I often hear, I actually heard from three different groups this morning as I was sort of talking to people. People say, you know what's really cool is like, we always knew that interactions matter. I knew that. 
but I didn't have that thing. I didn't have that tangible thing that let me argue to legislatures that it mattered or that sort of gave me leverage around what exactly it was that mattered, right? So we're preaching to the choir. You all have known this. You didn't need the class to tell you that interactions matter. But I think what it's done is just helped enable a conversation and provided some data that has really leveraged our opportunity to impact what's happening in classrooms. So I just wanted to start today, just a little bit of interaction, um, and sort of bringing the teachers that we know and work with into the room a little bit. So just take a minute to think about one teacher. Maybe it was a teacher that you had as a young child. Maybe it was a teacher that you've worked with um, or somebody that your children has had. Just take a moment to think about that teacher and think about what sort of one sentence you would use to describe why that teacher was so phenomenal, why you wish every child could have that teacher. And then turn to somebody in the room, ideally somebody you don't know, and just share, share that story. Just say her name was, or his name was X, and this is why I think they're so phenomenal. So just take a moment to do that and share, share the stories of these great teachers. All right. All right, yes, I was an early childhood teacher. Um, so uh, this is going to be the hard part. It's not going to be getting you interacting. It's going to be to stop interacting for a little bit. Uh, no, but I think that's important, right? Like, I wish that there was some magical tool that could have recorded all those conversations and then put them up in some, like, concept mapped up on the board or those cool, what are those things called, where they, the, word, yeah, like a word cloud, right? Because I imagine many of you were saying the same kinds of things, and because, I am the speaker. I have the privilege of getting to choose two teachers, even though I only made you choose one, because I couldn't decide, right? Um, so one of the very coolest moments, this is kind of two cool moments combined into one of doing this work. So the first cool part was Bob comes into my office one day, probably, I don't know, eight years ago or so, and says, hey, Malcolm Gladwell wants to come and talk to us. I was like, Malcolm Gladwell? Was, he's doing this story on sort of snap judgments and how you can, anyway, uh, that's a whole nother story for another day. That was a really cool conversation to sit with. And what we did is we just got video and we watched video with Malcolm Gladwell for like two hours and it was really fun and he's super smart. Um, okay, but so then he w w wrote an article in the New Yorker and my name was in it, just barely, but it was in it. And uh, <laughs> about a month later, I got this email from a Janice, Janice Speth. And I was like, Speth, Speth, why do I know that name? You know, when it just comes in your inbox. And I opened it up. It was from my kindergarten teacher in Sacramento, California, who said, is this the same Bridget Hamry who was in my kindergarten class at Early Wine Elementary School in Sacramento, California? a long time ago, uh, <laughs> um, and she's like, I just wanted you to know that I read this article and I thought of you, and what was really cool is like, we've sort of kept in contact, and actually a year ago, she said I was cleaning up some stuff, and like, I thought she was really old when I was in kindergarten. <laughs> I don't know how old she is now, but she's clearly still totally with it, so she was cleaning up some stuff. And she sent me these photos of her and me working together when we were in kindergarten. Like, how, like, that, that was like one of the top moments, right? And like, it just speaks to the quality of interactions, the relationships are formed that, that, you know, you remember these things, that teachers remember them and that you as a person remember them. My mom will tell you that the reason why she loves Miss Fath is because I was a very young kindergartner, I was four, and an older brother, and I was determined that I was gonna go to kindergarten and learn how to read. And I came home on the first day of kindergarten and started crying. My mom asked me why I was crying, and I said, because I didn't learn how to read today. <laughs> um, but Mrs. Beth helped me learn to read over the course of kindergarten. So uh, anyway, so she's one very special teacher. And the other is this teacher, Benita. Some of you, anyone recognize this teacher? Boo, right, <laughs> boo, it's the boo teacher, um, right? So uh, this is a teacher that I worked with. I was her coach, very, very first my teaching partner. And as, as happens in this work, like she didn't need a coach, she was coaching me, right? Um, she, she was coaching me in what it means to be a good teacher. And, um, and what I loved about, about her, and it's not even that well reflect, reflected in this particular clip, 
But what I loved about her is that she spoke to her four-year-olds in a way that made them feel important. You know, they weren't just like little kids. She didn't talk down to them. And it wasn't about the fact that she sat on the ground with them here. It was really that every single interaction conveyed to them that they were important people with interesting things to say. Um, and, and that's really the thing. I mean, she was also funny and, um, and uh, impactful in many, many ways. But that's what I remember about her. So Lisa, I don't know if you can play the video really quick. So I will set this up as Lisa's playing it. It's just a very short clip of it. So raise your hand if you've seen this clip before. So this clip, uh, oh, sorry. Um, has been in the video library since its inception. So they're doing the, just a minute, uh, so they're doing the paths curriculum, and in fact, as she's introducing this activity, the kids have so much fun that she asked them to do it again. So this is just a little bit of her doing it again. You okay, because okay, when you wear a mask, you gotta be able to see through the holes. Okay, let's try it again. <laughs> Boys and girls, how are you doing today? Bye. And so your day is going okay? Yeah. You're excited about your trip? Yeah. Boom! <laughs> Just love it. <laughs> I seriously have watched that thing like a thousand times. Anytime I'm sad, I'm like, I just need a little boo. Uh, so, so, you know, this, I think we all have many of these teachers that we just hold in our mind and just wish that all of the kids were so lucky, right? All the kids that we worked with were so lucky to have teachers like her and like all of those that you were just thinking of. Um, so over the next two days, we're gonna be talking about a lot of things. We're gonna talk about data and technology, taking things to scale, but hopefully we'll also be talking about classrooms, right? Because this is where it all happens. And sometimes it's easy to lose sight of this. I don't think with this crowd, but um, I think as I was reflecting on this talk, I also just reflected on the fact that sometimes, at least for me, it seems so obvious that interactions matter. And it's easy to forget that it wasn't that long ago that there weren't that many people who, when you said the word quality, would even think about interactions. Probably all of you did. Um, but out in the world, the word quality meant lots of different things, as Yvette was sort of saying. So maybe it meant the teacher's uh, qualifications, maybe it meant the materials in the room, uh, maybe it meant the ratio, but you know, we really weren't paying enough attention to the interactions that were happening in classrooms. So where are we today? Well, we have the work that Yvette and her colleagues and many of you have done in Head Start, where we're now paying attention to interactions. We have quality rating and improvement systems across the country that are paying attention to interactions. We have organizations like First Five California and others in many, many other localities, that similarly, that are really finding ways to focus on interactions and on supporting improvements in interactions in classrooms. We have great organizations, partner organizations like The Ounce. I would say that's another interact, it's another multiplier for us. You know, Teach Stone can do some things, but it really is our interaction with great other organizations that are helping us leverage these changes across the landscape. Um, and then we have uh, Bentley, and it's my shout out to Bentley and his colleagues in Georgia, uh, and the Georgia Pre-K program, many other Pre-K programs across the country who are using, um, using the class and focusing on interaction. So we've come a long way. The field, you know, now when you say quality, you're much more likely to get somebody thinking about what's actually happening in the classroom. But we're not all the way there, right? <laughs> so. Um, I was reminded of this as I taught this online course. I've taught several versions of this. One of them was a, a MOOC, a massive open online course. Anybody here happen to, to take the MOOC that was on effective classroom interactions? It was about two years ago. All right, a couple folks. So um, there were 25,000 people from around the world who enrolled in the course. About 5,000 of them actually completed, which I hear is a very high completion rate for MOOCs. <laughs> Sounds fairly pathetic to me. Um, but, but, but what was really fascinating is reading through the sort of conversations that people were having. And these quotes actually come from um, an online course that we taught at UVA, so I actually knew these teachers a little bit more. Um, but what we did is, in some of the opening materials, just shared some basic data with them on what we know about how often children are interacting with, with adults in a typical day, how often they spend sort of in transitions and routines, and then what the quality of their interactions are. And so here, this is, and this is just from a couple of years ago, right? Here's what teachers say. 
As a teacher, I always felt that children learn best from other children and they learn through play. True, right? But the context was, I, I didn't realize that what I do actually matters. Said another way, I didn't stop to think about how important the verbal interactions between teacher and student are throughout the day. So even though this is obvious to us, it is not obvious to all of the teachers. Um, we haven't done a good job of letting folks know. It's not that they don't want to know, it's just that we haven't done a good job of communicating that. Um, this is my favorite. This, this teacher um, was a little grumpy. So I was surprised about the false research that children are not spending most of their times engaged in learning ac activities. I find this hard to believe because children can learn and not know that they're actually learning. When engaging with children, playing games, counting, stacking blocks, children are in fact learning. However, it's done in a fun, fulfilling way that children are unaware of and is indeed a golden opportunity that is overlooked. So I think what this teacher is saying, it's a little, a little convoluted, but I think what she's saying is, we just need to let them play and they will learn, right? And children learn through play. We don't want to counteract that. But I think so many teachers have been taught that actually interacting interferes with learning. Um, so it's not just that they've been taught not how to interact, but they've actually been taught that if they interact, they will interfere with what is a natural learning process. And I think this is actually one of our great challenges right now, um, is how we convey this idea about the importance of interactions in the complex way that it is, right? Because all of those teachers are right, right? Kids learn from their peers, they learn through play, but I think the challenge that we face now, beyond just letting people know that interactions matter, is the sort of more complex part of that, is how do you put play and instruction together in a way that is developmentally appropriate and makes sense. And that is something that people still have a hard time putting their heads around. And I think we have a lot to do um, to really move the field in that direction. Um, you know, too often now we see, uh, we see this actually in state pre-K in Virginia, right? So we're hiring lots of third and second and first grade teachers to teach in early childhood classrooms. They're interacting with the kids, right? But it's not in the most developmentally appropriate ways. The kids actually aren't playing. So we, you know, we just have to find the right balance. Um, and I think many of you in this room are sort of fighting that fight every day. And I hope to hear some good stories about how you're making progress. Um, OK, so that's the sort of seed of this idea, is that we know interactions matter. Um, so what's been happening over the last 15 years or so that's helped to grow that idea? Um, I think there's three core things that we've been working on at UVA and that many of you have been working on and many others who are not in the room. Um, and the first is just this idea that it's not just that interactions matter, but what teachers are doing matters. And we need to unpack and understand the specifics behind what actually is happening in the classroom. So being able to sort of map that terrain has been a big part of what we've done. And then we need to actually measure them, right? Science moves forward through measurement. And that can be a painful process. I remember somebody very early on telling me, it is impossible to put a number to teaching. Like, you can't, it's too much of an art. Um, you can't put a number there. So we've put some numbers there, right? They're not precise. <laughs> There's lots of messiness when we start to put numbers to something as complicated as teaching. But if we don't try, if we don't measure them, then we just don't know what's going on. So, so I think that's been a really important piece, though a challenging piece of the work. Um, and then, you know, this is where my heart is. Like, measurement's great. Um, but ultimately, really, that's all to leverage improvement. So I actually remember, a very early conversation after we heard that class was in the regs, um, and I think it was even before Yvette came on board, and there were sort of conversations about how we're going to do this. And from the very beginning, I think the folks at Head Start and we were very clear that if this is just about the DRS, if this is just about holding programs accountable, it's going to fail, right? We have to equally invest in and support improvement efforts and give people the tools that they need to know and understand what interactions are and to make improvements in them, or else the whole thing is going to fail. So that's been a really central part of the work throughout. Um, so, so as I was prepping for this talk, I don't know if you guys have this, this thing, um, I was like, I feel like I've said what I'm trying to say before, but I can't really remember. And so I sort of went through some of the dregs of my old files. My class folder in my um, laptop is very ugly. Um, and I realized where it was. So 
maybe it still is in here, I don't know, I don't pay enough attention, I should. Um, but in the very first Train the Trainer, when I had people coming from around the country to be trained, I was trying to think like what information beyond the sort of logistics of training do I think it's important to impart? Um, so the first was this idea that class is class is class. It's a little controversial, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit. Um, the other, and this came from a training, I can tell you I like remember the room I was sitting in, from uh, a training I did in Wyoming very early on uh, with a very frustrated group of people, but with their leader who stopped with people being very frustrated, not learning the tool, not understanding it, and said, come on guys, what we're trying to assess is something really complicated. If this was easy, if we just needed to count something, then it wouldn't be any good, right? So it has to be hard. I wish it wasn't so hard, and I think we need to work on making it less hard, but, but it, it is hard. And this is a Bob Piantism. Um, we're staking a claim and let the data decide. So I'm gonna talk about that at the very end. So the first is this idea of class is class is class. So first of all, I wanna be very clear. So if this tree is a classroom, I'm, I'm trying to kind of stay with the seed metaphor, I don't know if it was really working for me, but um, <laughs> I'm gonna stick with it. Uh, right, it's really complex. So any of us who've gone into classroom and spent time watching, there is so much going on, it's really hard to know what to pay attention to. I don't spend enough time in classrooms um, anymore, but the other day I actually was in a classroom and I, didn't, I wasn't wearing my class lenses for a while and I found myself about you know, 10 minutes into the observation thinking like, oh God, I'm not, I was just tracking this little boy who was having a lot of problems and like hiding behind and doing something that nobody knew. I'm not sure what it was. Uh, and, uh, and then I like remembered, I'm like, oh right, put on your class lenses. That helps like bring like what is kind of chaos, lots of things, it brings a little order to a, a very chaotic system, right? But what's important to, to say when I say class is class is class is like we are so aware of the fact that we are not measuring everything that matters that's happening in classrooms. We've had to very much sort of simplify the picture of something that's really complicated in order to be able to measure and assess it well. Um, but I think we've done a pretty good job of that. <laughs> but I think it's always, and I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit at the end, you know, there's still a lot of things that are happening in classrooms that we're not getting a good handle on as we go, um, as we go forward in this work. I can say again, um, in our work in um, pre-K expansion in Virginia, they're using, most of the school divisions um, are using creative curriculum. And there's a fidelity tool for cre creative curriculum, but it's long and it's sort of hard to use and it's not being used as a part of the work at scale. And so like, I just have no, I know what the class and Ecker scores are for all of the classrooms in Virginia. I just have no idea if they're even using the curriculum. I'm pretty sure some of them are not using it at all. I'm sure some of them are using it totally inappropriately, but we just don't have the same tool, kind of tools to help us get leverage, especially given that there are three school divisions who are not using creative curriculum. So, and I, I know I've talked to many folks in the QRS world who are trying to get their heads around how you measure sort of curriculum or um, exposure to content. Um, so that is just to say, we're measuring something, it's the class, it's interactions, but there's still a lot more that we could be paying attention to over time. That's probably another collective challenge. Um, so we're all familiar with this. Um, you know, again, even 10 years ago, so if Jonathan, he probably doesn't remember this, but I expect probably when um, some of the earliest folks to be trained, we had a very old manual, there were no um, there were, there were, have always been domains. There have always been dimensions. Well, there were always dimensions, maybe not domains. We started with dimensions, uh, but there weren't indicators. There weren't behavioral markers. In fact, I almost pulled this out. The, the sort of earliest versions of the class had positive climate, a little description, and then like three or four sentences at the low, mid, and, and high points, right? And so a part of the work of measurement has been trying to, to sort of get the landscape and really identify what's important. And when we did this, the intention was really about improving measurement, but what I've observed over time, and this has been true in our own sort of professional development work, is that this sort of very specific description of behaviors has been really, really helpful to the field on the improvement side. Because otherwise these things just seem so abstract. Um, and so again, I would say, sometimes I think people want to make, well people always want to make the class a checklist, right? Um, but, but the behavioral markers are not intended to be a checklist. There are more things that happen in classrooms that reflect each of these dimensions that aren't even described, right? But at least it starts to give something tangible that we can hold on to that teachers can watch in videos or watch in their own teaching in ways that I think have been really helpful and really important. So now, uh, 
my colleague Jennifer is in the back of the room, they just completed a sort of survey of the um, studies that have been conducted on the class. And then there's actually over 170, I think, Jennifer, um, peer-reviewed articles that have used the class in a variety of countries, in a variety of settings. Up here, there are some results from um, Chile, also from China. Like, it's kind of miraculous. This is another one of those, like, interact moments, right? Like, we've done a little of this research, but really it's been providing a tool that has allowed researchers around the country and around the world to be able to study and understand what matters in classrooms in ways that I think are really cool. So I'm not gonna talk about all that research, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of key pieces. So um, there's a lot of talk about toxic stress. At the beginning of our um, Virginia expansion work, we went to each of the different 11 school divisions across Virginia. I spent a lot of time on the road. Um, I was glad it wasn't in California, because at least Virginia is a smaller state. Um, but almost every place we went, people were talking about toxic stress, right? I think it's a little bit of the new like lingo. But it's real, right? Kids are really experiencing a lot of stress. But what we actually know is that being in childcare is just stressful. Even if you're in pretty decent environments, it's a stressful thing. You know, anyone who's dropped their child off, I'm looking at Lisa, <laughs> uh, in childcare knows. My own child was kicked out of childcare, a really crappy childcare, so I, I've experienced this firsthand. Um, and he was also sent home on the second day of kindergarten, so, you know. You might know something, but you can't uh, do much about it. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, so, so environments are stressful, right? So in fact, when in just sort of uh, observational studies, um, when they're collecting cortisol, which is a measure of, of stress, they get it through collecting little swabs of spit from kids. That's got to be fun, right? Um, uh, we see that, so the normal cortisol pattern is that it's highest at the beginning of the day and then it goes down, right? Um, but for kids in childcare, for 70 to 80% of them, it actually it, it increases over time. So that, it, that's just an indicator at a sort of physiological level that it's stressful being around other kids in unfamiliar environments, et cetera, it's stressful. Um, but Bridget Hatfield, a former postdoc who's now at the Oregon State, did a really nice study that showed that classrooms that were higher on emotional support had children who were less likely to show that pattern, they were less stressed. To me, like, I just think that, like, it's amazing to me that we could have this, like, manual, right, this thing in the class that can measure something so essential that we can, like, pick it up in the spit of four-year-olds, right? Like, that's just kind of cool. Um, I'm a dork, I know. Uh, <laughs> But it speaks to me that, you know, sometimes we talk about the fact that the correlations between class and outcomes, they aren't that high. That is true. They aren't that high. There's lots of reasons for that. But one of the reasons is we aren't even on the outcome side. We aren't even always measuring the things that actually really matter, right? Like, so sometimes we look at math learning. Well, math learning only happens if math is occurring, <laughs> you know? So you can have great instructional support and not see any math outcomes because there's no math happening, right? Um, but I feel like getting to this sort of physiological level really gets to a very meaningful level and, and demonstrates the way that interactions matter. So um, video always speaks really well to this. So Lisa, if you wanna just cue this up. So this is a, a little girl, toddler, who is upset. Um, I, I have two two-year-olds. Um, they actually turned two today. Yay! Uh, and I, yes, I am missing their second birthday. Um, but, uh, so I'm very familiar with this scene. So she wanted to clean up, and somebody cleaned up for her, and she's very sad about it. <laughs> so, cue the video. Yeah. about the bus. You wanted to pick up the bus off. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I see something else. Can you help with the food that made you Andre, your, we're going to clean them up. Thank you. Oh, she said you don't want it. Yet. What are you going to clean up? She didn't want it. 
Thank you for help, um, wanting to and help and her. Can you help me put it away? <laughs> Thank you. Ariana, Ariana, you can come what over here to me. To clean up. We still need to clean something up. What do you want to do to be ready? It's almost time for music. So watch how she comes out of it. And Ariana. Miracle, you can see that. Because we're going to the door to go to the music and dance. Show me Are you you're ready? ready to do the music and dance? Okay, let's go. Are you ready? I'm coming too. Are you ready? You're ready. Let's go. Okay, let's close the door. Let's go over there by the door to go with us to do music. She closed the refrigerator door. The other she can throw the balls that are in the box. She can put them in the basket where they go. So, right, it's like those small moments. Like, it's just a moment. She probably would have been fine. But re imagine repeatedly over time if she doesn't have that teacher there, if she doesn't have somebody, and maybe she could have calmed herself down, but imagine what that little, like, three-year-old body was feeling on the inside. And if that's just repeated over time without the adults there to sort of support that regulation, to move it from something that, that she was feeling so deeply to a time when she could sort of move on to the next activity, that's really why um, we do what we do, right? Um, uh, OK, yeah. Um, so, so that's one piece of research. The other that I think is really helpful um, piece of the work is just a, sort of as Yvette is saying, like, now we have a lot of data. We got to get better about using it. I'm with you. Um, but it's helped us better understand what kids are actually experiencing out in the real world, right? So there have been now a lot of studies that have sort of documented nationwide within your own states about what's actually happening. Um, and uh, Daphna Basak and Eva Galdo just published this paper using data from a large state um, set of observations and really demonstrate that when we look, that, that we sort of have a ways to go if we want to make sure that every child has access to high quality interactions. So here they just looked at the percentage of children who had access to high quality. That was one standard deviation above the mean on the class in emotional support, classroom organization, and instructional support. And they looked at it using zip code data. Um, and so they looked at groups, sort of centers and classrooms that were in very high poverty areas and then in low poverty areas. So what we just see is unequal distribution, right? Um, interestingly, not for instructional support. We could probably have some conversations about that. Um, but if you are a poor child, you're much less likely attending a center in a, in a poor area. You're much less likely to have access to high quality interactions. Now, what's really interesting is it kind of flips when you look at low quality. Um, oops, sorry. <clears throat> so when we look at low quality interactions, that's one standard deviation below the mean. We actually see not as much of a difference for emotional support and classroom organization, but, but a huge difference for instructional support. So if you are a high poverty kid, you are much less likely to be getting a really bad instructional support experience, which one standard deviation below the mean in these data essentially means there's nothing cognitively stimulating happening for you, right? Um, so this to me is just our action call. It's why we're here. There's work to be done, and by class as class as class, by sort of using this tool, it's helped us see and compare in ways that I think have been really helpful to the field. Okay, so the next quote. If it's too easy, it can't be any good. So here I just wanna, um, this is probably cathartic for me. Um, so I started working with Bob in 1997. I was a grad student. Um, then I went away back to California, which is where I'm from. I thought I was gonna be there forever. And then he called and he's like, you have to come back. We have some work to do. I'm not sure what it is, but I need you here. And then I got there and um, <laughs> this is what he told me. He said, okay, so we're gonna start using class in our teacher education program. So in two weeks, we have all of our student supervisors coming back. The student supervisors are, are usually new graduate students in teacher education who are the ones who supervise our, teacher edu our undergrad teacher education students. Um, and so you just need to train them all in the class. And I stopped for a second. So this is 2004. I said, Bob, we just have a pre-K manual. And I'm supposed to train people in, in like social studies in high school? He's like, yeah, 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 it's fine. He said, we have, we have the NICHD study. We have tapes from first, third, and fifth grade. That'll be fine. Just master code those using the pre-K manual and then train folks. <laughs> I was like, what? So here, okay, you can ask Bob about this tomorrow. Here's the thing. He would probably disagree with this statement. 
only because he doesn't think anything is hard, right? <laughs> and that's why he has been so successful, because like it's all achievable, come on, and, and, and you don't have to seek perfect perfection to be better than what is happening now, right? But he didn't have to actually train these people. <laughs> So I and Jason Downer and, and Megan Stolman and a few other colleagues like got these videos out and they were literally cassettes, I'm telling you, like they were cassettes, in case anyone's young enough not to know what that is. Um, <laughs> and to put it in a little VCR. Uh, yeah, so we did that. We master coded a fifth and third and first grade video using the pre-K manual and then we kind of trained some people. We like, got, they had a test. It didn't go that well. My, one of my favorite emails was, was from a student at the end who said, I am a very reliable person, and I do not appreciate you questioning my reliability. <laughs> Missed. <laughs> All right. So fast forward a few years, and um, you know we're actually doing a really great job of using the class at Curry in our teacher education program. Um, and folks are actually using MTP with our, our you know, we actually train them using actual video footage of those real classrooms, so we've come, we've come a long way. But it's hard, right? Um, so this is actually a picture from the Teach Stone website of a class training. Raise your hand if you're a class trainer. Oh, gosh, look at all you. All right, so you're familiar with this general picture. Um, I think one of my greatest days was when I no longer had to class train and I could do the train the trainer, because it's so much easier. There's not a test at the end, right? <laughs> like, or not the same way. Because um, class trainings are hard. People get upset. And it, it well, oh, I think I have some pictures. Okay, you get this. <laughs> and that. I mean, seriously, has, raise your hand if somebody has ever cried in a class training for you, right? Like, people cry. And I will tell you that it is better than it used to be because when we first started, there was no online, tr online testing, so you had to take the test. So you had to sit there for two days, some of you went through this, and then sit in the same room and take the test, and then the trainer, me, had to sit down and say whether you passed or not. Like right there in the room, it was really not good. So I got a lot of this. Um, and then sometimes people did this, um, needed a little drink to get it through. <laughs> um, but, we have success, right? Like, people pass. And to me, this is still one of the, like, I'm, I'm just amazed that we now have been able to train so many people, you know? So now, people around the country can all watch a video and all be seeing the same things and all give fairly similar numbers. Like, that's kind of crazy. It's like some, like, magic trick, right? Um, so I had Jennifer pull these data for me. So just Raise your hand if we think how many people have been class certified since we started counting, which I don't know when that was. Um, anyone think about 5,000? Raise your hands. 15,000? 25,000? About 25,000? 35,000? 50,000? Yeah, so the actual number is 35,788. Right? And probably more than that, because that's uh, not everybody. Because we didn't count Jonathan back in the day. I'm going to just keep picking on you <laughs> all the time, because he's sitting right up front like a good student. Um, uh, interestingly, I wasn't going to uh, show these, but I will. This is interesting, right? Of that 35, and they don't actually add up to one because of multiple certifications, but it's almost all in pre-K. So folks, if we think that interactions are important for infants and for toddlers, and for K3, we got some work to do, right? Um, we at Teach Stone have some work to do. Uh, you know, and those of you working in those settings, I think we don't have the same capacity to be supporting the kinds of changes that I think have occurred at, in um, preschool. All right, so change is always ahead and change is hard. So this is the sort of it's hard part of the talk. Um, and we know change is hard. We know that asking teachers to change is really hard. Um, and that's been a lot of the work that you do, a lot of the work that we do. Um, and I just wanted to share one sort of intriguing piece of data that we have from some of our recent work. Um, I'll set it off by this. I love this. I've used it before. I love it in part because often there's like people in the room that represent. So we have the teacher and the, you know, the kids that are a bit challenging on one side. And, but then on the other, this is the part that I love. I should make you raise your hands. We have race to the top gurus. Ed school PhDs, anyone, anyone? Think tank thinkers, foundation analysts, 
and advocacy advocates, all telling this teacher what she should be doing. And my favorite part is there's a guy video yeah. <laughs> Right? So it's like perfect. Um, all right, so it's stressful being a teacher, asking these teachers to change what they're doing. That's hard, right? And this is made up data, but we actually know from lots of different fields um, a lot about stress and, and the way that stress relates to change. And so what this really says on the x-axis is just how stressed out you are, and on the y is how likely you are to change. So we all know that if you're not stressed at all, you're not going to change. Raise your hand if you've ever worked with a teacher who you would like to be more stressed, right? <laughs> right? Like a little bit of stress is a motivator. We want to get people out of their comfort zone because if you just think like, I I'm doing fine, you know, you're probably not very motivated to change. But on the other end, we don't want people to be totally emotionally exhausted and stressed out because that's not helpful either, right? So we designed this online course for early childhood teachers. We gave it to them. And we found out we were stressing them out, right? So the red is our control group measured before and after the course. And the green is, I mean, the blue is our uh, teachers who took our online course. So we made them more emotionally exhausted. This quote epitomizes that. This is a discussion board quote from a teacher in our course. She says, uh, it was during regard for student perspectives. I am sorry, but I have students who will literally take out someone if they're not given restrictions about where they sit or how to act. A few of them are completely clueless about how to act towards others or how to treat others. I feel like an awful teacher now and fear that my class would self-destruct if I didn't keep some control. You guys don't know my students, right? And what we also know is actually, and this is an awful thing to happen in a discussion board, because we actually find that posts like this that are very emotionally charged get fewer responses than those that are less sort of emotionally charged. Because I think everybody's like kind of scared, right? Like how do you enter that kind of emotion in something like an online course? But thankfully, we, we did something that was really useful. So some of our teachers just had access to the online course. They had homework assignments where they videotaped themselves, they analyzed their own video, they posted that for their instructor. Everybody got sort of written feedback from their instructor. But half of the teachers actually had conferences that were a little bit like coaching sessions with their instructor, six times throughout the semester. And what we found is that those teachers who are now in red did not get nearly <laughs> stressed out. They got a little stressed, but hopefully the good kind of stress, um, as those who only had access to the online course. So I think this is important to us as we think about what's supporting change that, and this is no surprise, like interactions matter right at every level. So we can't just, um, we can't just buy teachers something that is going to make them change, right? We really need to invest with them and think about how we're going to support them. Um, so this is an example of a similar kind of teacher in her conference, right? So we audio recorded her, these. She says, I find myself finding more bad moments than good. This is her reflecting on when she's watching her own videos for her homework. I was like, I shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't have said that. What could I have said different? It's, it's pretty good. She's talking about being in an online course. It's making me think and talk about how I talk with the children and make them think. It's good, but I could not spot the good things I did as easy as the bad things, right? And this is very common. Um, and I'm not going to read all of this, but the gist of what the instructor is saying back is, that's OK. That's true for everyone. But I really encourage you to take some time to find those good spots, because it's actually less stopping doing the bad things and more just taking a moment to recognize the good things that you're doing and doing them more. Now, that's not just like we just have to be nice to teachers and only point out the good things. And in fact, sometimes I think there's a danger in just doing that. Um, we need to be able, and teachers ask us to be critical. But it is, I think, on the emotional side, the sort of recognition that what I, I'm actually doing something well and I can build on that is a real powerful motivator for change. So we've now seen through some of our studies, probably some po folks in the room, um, and, and across a number of different contexts, a lot of different coaching programs that can change interactions, so that's exciting. We've seen college courses that actually can change the quality of interactions. We've seen online courses, so in fact, the teachers who had the sort of conferences with their instructor actually did pre-post change their um, interactions with children. Um, and even workshops, the much you know, maligned workshop that I hate, um, but if thoughtfully designed and structured in a sort of scope and sequence, um, something like MMCI or something similar really can and has been shown um, in, in our studies and others 
to really change practice. So the common thread, I think, in all of that is really just this idea that seeing teaching can transform teaching. And again, like, let's not forget that it hasn't been that long that um, it was really hard to see teaching, right? So if you were a typical teacher educator, maybe you saw one or two classrooms while you were in training, and then you got your own classroom. And maybe occasionally you get to like sneak out and uh, look at one of your colleagues' classrooms. But really, it's a very lonely profession. And so we live in a really exciting time where we have lots of opportunities to support teachers seeing themselves teach, seeing others teach, and we know that it is in the seeing that we can transform teaching. Um, but we can't forget the interpersonal part of it. We can't just, I'm sorry to say, teach don't folks, give everybody the video library and call it a day, right? <laughs> it's, that's not the end of it. We really have to think about how we combine that sort of ability to watch practice with a supportive environment of our colleagues or peers or coaches, and that's really what the work is about. So I think our collective challenge, what we'll do and hear about over the course of the next few days, is at the systems level, um, as Yvette was saying. How can we sort of design systems which are going to help teachers see these other classrooms, see what's good in what they're doing, what's not so good, um, in the context of a supportive relationship. Um, and that's really the work that all of you have been doing. And I'm really excited to, I'm just, I wish I could be in all the sessions, but I'm going to be in whatever room it is where I get to hear um, from the field about what's happening, because I think um, that's, uh, I think the value of Teach Stone right now is the ability to convene lots of folks and be able to share the stories. Because, again, I'm going to keep talking about it, but in these 11 school districts that I'm working in Virginia, they just need models for, you know, they're using the class, but they need models about how you use it in ways that actually lead to transformation. And we need to do a better job of that sort of implementation information and getting that out there. Um, otherwise, they just become a set of numbers. So all of you have had to deal with lots of change. There's more change ahead, we know. There's lots of roadblocks along the way. I'm sure we can hear lots of stories about various roadblocks. My very personal favorite um, is uh, when a state very early on wanted to use the class. I got a call from somebody in their Department of Education that said, so we want to use the class, but we need you to change the name. <laughs> She said, we can't, so, so you, we can't have emotional support because, and I, I am not making this up. I'm really not making this up. She said, um, in our state, the Department of Social Services kind of owns emotions. And the, the, <laughs> and, the uh, uh, and the Department of Ed, we could talk about social support, but emotional support we can't talk about. I said, no. <laughs> I think you could convince them that the emotions are okay, and they ended up using it, and it was all good, right? But there's like silly roadblocks uh, along the way. So you've all <laughs> been busy <laughs> drinking lots of coffee, trying to uh, do the, you know, manage these roadblocks. And hopefully, what we can do over the next two days, okay, it doesn't look like this outside, in case you're wondering. Um, but it's just offer an opportunity for reflection, to hear from your colleagues, to stop, get you out of your crazy times, and just hear from others and reflect on your work. Um, as Yvette says, what, what is it that you can do? What can you take home and learn from colleagues about how you're going to do this work moving forward? Um, so I'll just end with you know, the Bobism. We're staking a claim and, and let the data decide. Um, so we really care about data not just in a geeky way, but in a, like it's just foundational to who we are. So I think you might know this, but you might not. So when we were coming up with a name, um, Grace Funk, who's been a colleague of mine for a long time, her, her anyone know Grace, been trained by Grace? Ah, uh, yep. Uh, so um, her dad works in advertising and he was working on names for us and said, he came back with a lot of them and one of them was Teachstone and he said it sort of references a touchstone. Um, and it, does everybody know what a touchstone is? So it's a thing they sort of use to test to see if gold was really gold. So if you rubbed it on the, on the stone, you would know. Um, so this is the sort of simple definition. So a black stone related to flint and formerly used to test the purity of gold and silver by the streak left on the stone when rubbed on metal. A test or criterion for determining the quality or genuineness of a thing. And to me, like, that always needs to be what Teach Stone is about. Like, you need to be able to trust 
that what we do is real, right? It's not that we're just out there trying to sell things. Um, we are partners with you in this process, and if it's not good, if the data is telling us it isn't working, then we have a problem to solve, because it's a lot of work what we're doing, and we really need to be able to do that work together. Um, so we will continue to always be a very sort of data-driven company, which brings us back to the seed of this idea. Um, uh, so over the next two days, be bold. Um, in working with the 11 school divisions, we were just doing continuous improvement plans with them, and they were setting goals. And we used this picture, so be bold. Go beyond current expectations. Don't make about this compliance. What can we, as a group of people, do, not just in these two days, but as we go forth in the world to, to sort of achieve something meaningful? And this is what I would argue is our sort of broad shared goal. Um, it's what Rebecca said. It's this every young child will have teachers that provide responsive and cognitively stimulating interactions throughout the day. Not just one accidental year, but year after year after year after year. In every kind of place that they go to, right? And we are so far from this. that We have a really long way to go. But I think with the sort of power of folks like you in the room, I think we have a really um, great opportunity to achieve that. Um, so I just want to end um, back with my friend Benita. So I sort of started with us thinking about teachers. I just want us to sort of stop by thinking about the kids, right? So let's end and sort of move into our work. So one, I said that mostly um, Benita was schooling me and teaching me, but there was a moment when she had a really hard time, and it was a moment when a child actually bit her. It was a kid who had had a lot of struggles, had a family that was very disengaged, and this sort of threw her for a loop, and she got really mad. You know, not blatantly mad at him, but mad about the whole thing, and in a way that really blocked her from being able to see the sort of positive things that he was doing. Um, the program actually wanted to expel him, to kick him out. Um, and over the course of working together, um, I helped her, I think, through watching videos of herself interacting with him, realize the capacity that she had to make a difference for this kid. He wasn't expelled, and that really was, was this teacher going to the administrator and saying she would quit if they expelled him. Um, you know, that is about, that's what we do, right? That made a difference for this kid, and it's those kind of trajectories of kids that that's, that's why we're all here. So think about the kids as you go out and do the work, and I'm just, again, really privileged and excited to get to hear about all the work that you all have been doing. So thank you very much.